Hey guys, we're going to go ahead and get started so that we can make sure we're out on time. And uh, let me set the, uh, the pace here. We're going to spend a little bit of time looking in Scripture and talking about the issue of foster care and adoption uh, as, as, uh, from the perspective of Scripture. And we're going to explore the heart of God. We're going to look at what that means for us practically. And then Kyle's going to come up at the end. And he's going to share a little bit about with, uh, with you some next steps here at Grace. Very practical. Our goal is that you leave here with a couple of different things in your hand. Number one is a greater depth of understanding and appreciation for and even celebration of the work of Christ for you. But then also second, very practical and tangible pieces of work, uh, let's say, that you can do as a result of leaving this room so that you don't just get fire hydrated, you know, just overwhelmed with information today and then left with, hey, good luck trying to figure out what to do next. That's not our goal here. Our goal is to provide you some very practical, tangible things that you can do in light of the things that we're going to talk about. Then at the end of that, we will open it up for Q&A. And so as, as we are talking and discussing and exploring different things, uh, be, be remembering or writing down questions that you might have, thoughts that you might have. And maybe it's a thought that you're having that you have some clarity on, but you're thinking, you know what, this is a question that I've heard many people ask uh, uh, in this particular space. And so I'm going to ask it maybe even for the sake of other people in the room, right? So let's be in this together, uh, be considering questions, thoughts that you might have, and we're going to leave some space at the end for us to address uh, all of those, answer all of your questions. I mean, you're just going to walk out of here experts. That's the goal, right? <laughs> no. So for some of you, you're going to need to walk out of here um, maybe a bit contemplative, kind of thinking more internally into, in yourself of, okay, well, if all of this is true, then what does it mean for me? Some of you came into the room maybe um, already led in this particular direction uh, for, for one reason or the other. The Lord has led you uh, to, to have a heart for this, um, but maybe there's some concerns that you've had, some anxieties, some questions, uh, and maybe we'll be able to address those and maybe we won't, but uh, at the end, um, it might mean for you that uh, you walk out of the room and you don't necessarily need a piece of paper in your hand knowing what to do next because you already know in your heart, it's time for me to do this. Whatever fears, anxieties, concerns I had coming in, it's time for me to step over those and move around those and, and do this because I know that the Lord is calling me to do this. So whatever brought you into the room this morning, uh, we pray that you leave with something, uh, some sense of clarity and, and next steps for you. So my name is Jason. Uh, my wife, Emily, and I, Emily's in the room over here. I won't point her out too much. She doesn't like that. Uh, we uh, live here in town. My wife, Emily, grew up here um, most of her life, so all of her family's here. We met here at A&M. We actually met in the Harrington building in class. Anybody have a class in Harrington? So if we had a son, which we don't, we were gonna, his middle name for me was going to be Harrington. But the Lord has blessed us with four girls so far. And I don't really know that any of them would appreciate the name Harrington in their name. We met in, I think it was room 20, 207, upstairs in Harrington, seats 115 and 116. <laughs> I have pictures on my phone uh, to commemorate. Uh, we've actually visited there a couple of times. Last semester, we, um, on our anniversary of the day that we met, or our wedding, I'm not sure, we went up to campus and we snuck into Harrington in the middle of class, sat in our seats, took a selfie, and then ran out while the professor was, <laughs> while the professor was teaching. So we met here at A&M, we met in class, and there's a long story behind that, and we were married uh, less than nine months later. So it was, I knew immediately. And if you do the timing, the whole nine month thing is a little scary for people from meeting to getting married. But that was definitely not our issue, although I'm sure that some people thought it was. I just knew immediately this is the woman I need to marry. Since then, um, we've been involved in ministry um, forever, and most of that has been down in the Houston area uh, after graduating. We moved down there about a year after graduating, uh, involved in church ministry, youth ministry, young adult ministry, and then uh, planting a church in North Houston in the Woodlands, if you're familiar with the Woodlands. Um, seven years ago, and I was the lead pastor of that for five years. I now work with an organization called Christian Alliance for Orphans, and in large part, I travel around the country and I work with churches on foster care and adoption and orphan care issues. So I meet with leadership teams and I walk through resourcing and strategy and structure and how are you as a church going to do this well? Theological training, theological resourcing, very practical, strategic resourcing as well for churches, even a church like Grace. 
okay, what does this mean for us very strategically in terms of moving people and discipling people and connecting people? And you're going to hear some of that even at the end. Here's practical, tangible next steps for you. So much of my work um, involves uh, working with churches, and so today it's a blessing as, as part of Grace. My wife and I go to Southwood to be able to be here with uh, Grace family this morning. So I'm curious, um, what brings you in the room this morning? Here's what I want to do is find out from you how many current foster or adoptive families uh, do we have here this morning? Cool. All right. So um, how many of you, uh, and I'm, I'm curious to even hear from you if some of you would be willing, what brings you in the room this morning? If you're a college student, maybe even a young adult, uh, why do you feel like you need to be in this room this morning? I just need the one bold person to break the ice. There we go. Honestly, I just, uh, something that I've been considering for a while, just obviously I'm not like in a point of life where that's something to worry about just yet, but uh, it's something that I want to have thought over uh, a lot um, by the time I'm ready for kids. Yeah. So yeah, it's more about it. Because right now you're a college student? Uh-huh. Cool. Very cool. Because they're fostering now, they're fostering now. Pre, pre their own kids. Cool. Yeah, good thought. Yeah. Um, my brother and his wife, they're in Waco. They're fostering. They have three bio kids, and they're fostering their first child um, to adopt. And hopefully in the next few months they'll be able to adopt her. So that's our first up-close view of what this looks like, and mm-hmm. it's been wonderful, such a blessing for our family, and cool. really opened up our eyes to have that conversation. We don't know if we're called for it, but we'd like to hear more. Yeah. And you do you have your own bio kits? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Great. Yes. Yep. Perfect, yeah, and we're going to talk some about that, so that's great. Anybody else? Anybody in the room kind of thinking, I have no idea why I'm in the room. I just felt like I needed to be here. Yeah. Cool. Well, what I love is that we've got all ends of the spectrum. We've got um, college students, a very um, thoughtful young man over here, ladies. This is the kind of guy. He's already, <laughs> he's already thinking, you know, adoption stuff, uh, being uh, very uh, proactive on that, all the way to families that are, uh, have bio kids and are seeing the impact in their own family and now considering, well, what does this mean for us, maybe? Young marrieds that don't have their own kids yet, but are thinking um, maybe our, our you know, ideal planning of maybe after we have kids and we'll do this, maybe that's beginning to be uh, shifted a little bit, all the way to the opposite end of the spectrum. Grown kids, I assume, empty nester? Not yet. Not yet. Close. Yeah. One okay, so very, very close. But even still considering, um, you know, our job isn't done here yet. We've got so much left to do and to offer. That's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we do that, we're going to press into Scripture and ultimately what the Gospel has to say. This is a unique session in light of this conference. This conference is all about um, our faith in the workplace. And it's all about God's work on our behalf and then ultimately our work uh, on behalf of others in light of His work for us. So it's a unique um, kind of cross-section of a session here, but I believe that it fits perfectly. Because what we're going to talk about is the work of Jesus on our behalf and how that ultimately is what compels us to work on behalf of the orphaned and the vulnerable. That our motivation as believers is rooted in the gospel, the work of Jesus on our behalf. That's what motivates us. That's what compels us. That's also what sustains us in the midst of it when it's hard and when it's difficult, because it will be. 
I often liken it to marriage, if you will. Some of you might be engaged, almost engaged, recently married. All of us probably, though, um, understand that typically in churches there's a premarital counseling process. It's this process of, hey, we're so excited, we're engaged, we're going to get married, and the church says, great, here's what you need to do. You need to walk through this process of, ultimately, discipleship. We, wanna, we want your marriage to be rooted in the theology of, of marriage and scripture, to be connected well in a support system and a structure, uh, and, and also, in many cases, to be prepared for when it gets difficult. Because it's not always romantic, and it's not always bells and whistles. It's not always butterflies and, and roses, you know. Sometimes it's hard, and that's when the covenant really kicks in. How am I going to respond when it's difficult? And the ultimate goal in marriage is that we would be so infused with the gospel that even when it's hard, we consider it worth it. That we don't just bail on our marriage, because there's something greater in the eyes of God in this. Uh, for us. And the same is true as we care for vulnerable kids and orphans and step into their mess, that it's not always pretty. As a matter of fact, most of the time it's not. And so there's got to be something deeper that's compelling us and sustaining us as we step into that hard work. And it's ultimately the good work of Jesus on our behalf that compels us into it and sustains us in the midst of it. And so we're going to talk about that for a little bit here this morning. As you look through Scripture, you find all of these recurring themes running throughout the current of Scripture. And several of these themes uh, are really intended to and designed to point us back to the Gospel. That there's these pieces of imagery in Scripture that it's as if God said, how can I help my people understand these big theological conceptual ideas, but in a very practical, tangible, even daily uh, experiential kind of way? Let me illustrate that for you. You, all through scripture, you see this imagery of marriage running throughout the current of, of the pages. And ultimately, marriage, as we see in the New Testament and Ephesians especially, is this practical, tangible, relational, experiential thing that you and I in a very physical way can experience, but it's designed and meant to point us to and remind us of this big theological conceptual idea, the gospel where Paul says that husbands are to love their wives as Christ has loved the church and gave himself up for her, that that's the gospel. That as you love each other in this very physical, tangible, experiential relationship, it's ultimately meant to point you to the bigger picture of the work of Jesus on your behalf. So all through Scripture, we see God helping us out, really, helping us understand the gospel in a very experiential way by giving us the imagery of marriage. Another example that we see all through Scripture, especially in the New Testament, is the imagery of uh, the physical body. So as you read Romans, as you read Paul's letters to the Corinthians, you see him begin to frame us as the, as the people of God in the context of a human body. He says some are ears, some are eyes, some are hands, some are feet, uh, but all of us collectively together make up the body of Christ. And just like marriage is ultimately meant to point us to the work of Jesus, so too this physical, tangible illustration of the, of the body is meant to point us to the gospel. It reminds us that we were once outside of the body, but now because of the work of Jesus, we're inside of the body. We are a part of the body. We've been grafted in. And in a very physical, tangible way, all of us can relate to that because all of us have bodies. And all of us can relate to that, especially in a room like this, because we can look around and we can see all the different pieces of the body of Christ, even represented here, and we can be reminded of the work of Jesus on our behalf. So what does that mean? It means this. If you're like me, there's no other reason why you would get up early on a Saturday morning and sit in a room like this, except for the work of Jesus on your behalf, right? And so right now you can look around and say, the fact that I'm even sitting in this room with other believers who are connected to the same body as me reminds me of the work of Jesus on my behalf. This very physical, tangible reminder of a very spiritual uh, and big conceptual idea. You following me? So you see marriage running through the current of Scripture. You see this imagery of a physical body running through the current of Scripture. One of the most pronounced and beautiful pieces of imagery that God gives us to remind us of this big theological conceptual idea, but in a very relational, tangible, experiential way, is the imagery of adoption. So all throughout Scripture, you see this language, this family-oriented language. And it's this idea that we were once outside of the family of God, but now because of the work of Jesus, we've been brought into the family of God. 
that we are now sons and daughters of him, and we can now refer to him and relate to him as our father. So even Jesus goes so far as to say, uh, look, this is how you need to pray. And he starts off this way. He says, begin like this, our father who art in heaven. And even right there, we can stop, and that should cause us some pause. The fact that we can refer to God as Father, we can relate to Him as Father, reminds us, I was once outside of the family of God, but now because of the work of Jesus, I've been brought into the family of God. And this imagery of adoption is used all throughout Scripture to remind us in a very physical, tangible, experiential way of the beauty of the gospel and the work of Jesus on our behalf. And so every time we run across this idea in Scripture <clears throat> that we are sons and daughters of God, that we are children of God, that He is our Father, that we've been adopted into the family of God, we can pause and be reminded of the work of Jesus on our behalf. I was once outside of the family of God, but because of Jesus, I'm now inside of the family. I was once disconnected from the body of Christ, but because of the work of Jesus, I'm now grafted into the body of Christ, these physical, tangible reminders of this beautiful spiritual reality. One of the most beautiful places that uh, Scripture uses this imagery of adoption can be found in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. And if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. they will be on the screen as well. Uh, but I want us to walk through this passage uh, very methodically because it's really going to set the foundation and the tone for everything else that we're going to talk about uh, here this morning. So in Galatians chapter 4, Paul starts this way. He says, When the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman and born under the law. So let's stop right there at verse 4. Verse 4 is my favorite Christmas passage, although I very rarely hear it taught at Christmas. But in this very short, succinct statement, you get the definition of Christmas. That at just the right time, when the fullness of time had come, God sent his Son, born of a woman and born under the law. That that's what we celebrate at Christmas. That phrase, when the fullness of time had come, the idea that's being expressed there uh, is this idea of um, at just the right time. That there was a moment in time that God decided in his sovereign providential wisdom, he decided right here and right now is the exact perfect time for me to incarnate myself, be born of a woman, be born as a son, and be born under the law. That that's what we celebrate at Christmas. This idea that at just the right time, Jesus was born into this world on our behalf, born of a woman and born under the law. This passage screams so much to us about the character of God, about the work of God on our behalf. We can learn so much about who God is just in verse 4. What verse 4 tells us about God is that God's the kind of God that's not unaware of our plight. He's not unaware of our situation, that he sees our brokenness. But he's also the kind of God that doesn't just see our brokenness and kind of remain at a distance. I see it, I appreciate it, but I'm going to remain on the peripherals. No, he's the kind of God that sees our brokenness, sees our plight, and he's compelled to respond. And the way that he responds is he responds by interjecting himself into it. He doesn't say, I see your brokenness, and, uh, and I see you where you are, and here's where I am, and now here's the deal. You need to clean yourself up enough get out of your brokenness, you know, wipe yourself off, and then once you're good enough, you can move from where you are to where I am. That's not the kind of God that we serve. The kind of God that we serve is the kind of God that says, I see your brokenness, I see your plight, and I'm interjecting myself into it. That ultimately the gospel is God saying, I see you where you are, and I'm coming after you. That's the gospel. I see you where you are, and I'm coming after you. And not only that, but he does so at just the right time. That this isn't some haphazard work of God. This is this very intentional, providential work of God in our life. That he sees our plight, he interjects himself into it, and he interjects himself into it at just the right time. That's all in verse 4. That that sets the tone for everything else. That the gospel is ultimately the story of God seeing our plight and responding with the greatest act of love that this world has ever known. Ultimately, the coming of Jesus on our behalf to take on our brokenness upon himself and to free us from it. That's the gospel. Then this consequential effect of that is, is comprehensive in our lives. It changes everything. The fact that at just the right time, God interjected himself into our story uh, and, and, and took on our brokenness so that we could be freed from it. Everything as a result about us changes. 
I don't know about you, but it was even referenced here on stage a moment ago, this, this idea and this, this reality that we're really, really good at compartmentalizing our lives sometimes. Like, here's my spiritual life, here's my school life, here's my work life, here's this life, here's that life, right? And I'm really, really, really good at that. And I don't know about you, but I'm really good at saying, God, I want you to have your way in my life over here, but don't touch over here. Like, leave me alone over here, right? Or God, really bless my marriage, but don't touch my money. Or God, bless my job, but don't touch my comfort. Or all of these different ways that we play this, this spiritual gymnastics with God, right? And another aspect of our compartmentalizing is this idea that sometimes we're really good at saying, God, I believe what you've done for me in my past, that you've forgiven me of my past, but gosh, right now in my presence, I'm not real sure that you know what you're doing, right? Or God, I'm trusting you in my present now. Your evidence of grace right here in my life is true and is real and is thick, but I'm still carrying around the guilt and the remorse of my past because I'm not really sure that you've forgiven me of that. Or you might be different. You might say, God, I believe that you've forgiven me of my past. Like that has been dealt with. I celebrate that. But I'm really, really concerned about whether or not you've got my future under control. And I don't know about you, but I'm really good at jumping around in these different compartments of saying, God, I'm going to trust you at this stage of my life, but I'm real concerned about the next. Or I'm not quite sure about the one that we just came out of. And what we see in the gospel, this idea that Jesus interjects himself into our story, takes our brokenness upon himself, what we see in Scripture is that there is this consequential effect in all aspects of our life. It changes everything. It changes our past, it changes our present, and it changes our future. That there's no room in the gospel for us to say, God, I trust you here, but not over there. Because ultimately the gospel uh, is the story of no part of who we are going unaffected by the work of Jesus. And that's how Paul begins to outline the consequential effect of Jesus interjecting himself into our story. Everything changes as a result. So look at verse 5. That Jesus now has come into our story, born of a woman, born under the law. Why? To redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption. There's that word now that he uses, as sons. And that word causes us some pause. Okay, he's trying to say something here. We were once not something, and now we are. And in verse 5, he speaks to our past condition. If you'll notice, he uses past language. He says, to redeem those who were under the law. It's this idea in Scripture that we were once condemned under the weight of the law that we could not live up to. That we cannot meet the righteous standard of God. That we all fell short of the glory of God that we were condemned under the weight of a law we could not live up to. And Scripture goes so far as to use very strong language when it says that we were, uh, by nature, uh, enemies of God. There was enmity between us and God. There was strife between us and God. And then Paul, in another letter, uses these words. He says that we were, by nature, objects of the wrath of God. Like That's really, really heavy language, right? That in our past condition, we were in a really, really bad place. But Jesus interjected himself into that brokenness and redeemed us out from underneath it. Notice the contrast in verse 4 and verse 5. Verse 5 says that we were condemned under the law, that we were under the law. And verse 4 says that God was, God was uh, born of a son, born of a woman, born under the law. You see that? And so here we are condemned in our past under the weight of a law. And here's Jesus meeting us exactly where we are that we were under the weight of the law, and that's where Jesus ultimately met us. So not only does God see our plight and interject himself into it at just the right time, but he meets us exactly where we are, and he takes our brokenness upon himself. And so now, because of the gospel, we can look at our past, and we can declare, Romans 8, 1, that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, that my past has been dealt a decisive death blow in Jesus. It no longer condemns me. I've been set free. And that now changes my present reality. So my past has been redeemed, verse 5. Then we move on into verse 6, where it says, Because you are now sons, we've received this adoption. Because you are now sons, God has sent the Spirit of the Son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So this speaks to our present reality. My past has been, uh, has been redeemed. There is therefore now no condemnation. And my present reality now in Jesus has been shifted. 
Because now in my present reality, I've been given the spirit of, the, of God that's given me the capacity to cry out to God as Abba, Father. He uses that word. The word Abba is best translated in a very, it's a very tender and affectionate form of the word Father. Some of you may have even heard uh, some people say that uh, the equivalent uh, to the word Abba is our, our word Daddy. Why? Because it's this very tender and affectionate word for the word Father. It's the difference between my four girls, my four daughters calling me Father in this very proper British, you know, cold accent, which they don't, or calling me Daddy, which is what they do call me. That's a very different posture, right? It's a very different relationship. And what Paul is saying here is that because our past has been redeemed, our present reality with God has been shifted. It's changed everything about our posture towards Him and His posture towards us. That while in our past, our relationship with Him was defined by odds and enmity and strife, now in our present reality, our relationship with Him is defined by intimacy and affection. That everything about our relationship with Him has changed. That in our past, we used to have to be afraid of how he was going to respond to us because we were under condemnation. But now in our present, we don't have to be afraid. We can actually anticipate exactly how God is going to respond to us. Even in my shortcomings and even in my failures, I can bring those to God, my Abba, my Daddy, and I know exactly how he's going to respond to me, like any good Daddy would, with grace and compassion. Some of us, are we live in these present realities with God where we say, I celebrate you for the work that you've done in my past, that I've been freed from that, but there's this, these issues in my life now that I'm concerned about bringing to you. And in the gospel, that simply doesn't make sense. That we now have the capacity in our present reality to bring all things to the throne of grace and know exactly how God is going to respond to us because He is our present reality. So our present reality, He is our... Um, our Abba. So our present realities have been shifted. And then verse 7, he speaks to our future. He says, our future trajectories have been altered. So my past has been redeemed, my present has been shifted, it's been changed, and the future trajectory of my life has been altered, literally, for all eternity. Verse 7, he says this, so you are no longer a slave but a son, and if you're a son, then you're an heir through God. So this word heir, this is future language. An heir is someone who lives today with the promise and the guarantee and the assurance of what's to come tomorrow. So we live today knowing exactly what to expect tomorrow. That's what an heir is. That's what an heir does. And scripture says that our past has been redeemed, our present reality has been shifted, and the future trajectory of our lives has been guaranteed to us. It goes so far as to say that, that what we anticipate and what we look forward to in the future is glory. It's the glory of heaven all things being made new, all things being renewed, Jesus making all things right. That's our hope. That's our assurance. That's what we are heirs to. It says that while our outward bodies waste away, our inward souls and all of creation longs for that final and full day of redemption, that we live today with the guarantee and the hope of what's to come tomorrow. I don't know about you, but I have noticed increasingly that we are living in a world today that wants us to be very, very afraid of tomorrow. Especially now in the political climate that we're in. Watch very carefully and listen very carefully to this year-long political presidential campaign that we are all about to endure. And it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. The message is the same for all of them. This is the campaign platform. We are headed in a very bad direction and things are just going to continue to get worse if you don't elect me. You need to be very, very afraid if you don't elect me. But if you do, I'll fix everything. Otherwise, you need to be very, very afraid. If you guys are news watchers, everything is fear-mongering. Everything is breaking news. It's the biggest crisis. It's, it's two people in Idaho got a cold, and that's the new disease that's going to wipe us all out. Right? Ready? So, so get your hand sanitizer and wash your kids. Right? It's the next economic downturn that for college students, we're going we're gonna to scare you to death that there's no, co there's no jobs out there. Right? And you're going to be eating beans and rice out of the gutter for the rest of your life. And in the meantime, you're not going to get married and have kids. Your life is going to be horrible. Right? So you need to be very, very afraid. Watch the theme and the, the rhythm of the communication of the world that we live in, <clears throat> and it's fear. Some of the most popular TV shows these days 
are apocalyptic in nature. You notice that? Like we love vampires and zombies. Let's just be, let's just be honest. We love the idea of thinking about what it would be like after the world is annihilated and what society will look like. We, we are infatuated with movies that talk about the end of the world and, and the, the destruction of all the world system and this new reality. Hollywood wants us to be afraid of the future because they make a bunch of money off of our fear. The world that we live in is full of irony, uh, meaning some things are politically incorrect and some things aren't. Some things are socially unacceptable, but literally like the exact same thing over here is not socially acceptable. It's impossible to keep up with. One of the things that I find even, even more difficult to keep up with is the irony that the world wants me to love the things of the world. We all know that. If you've spent t any time in church, you've heard that idea, that don't love the things of the world. The world is enticing us to be consumed by and in love with the things of the world. But at the same time, the world wants us to love the world. The world also wants us to be afraid of the world. It's this very weird dichotomy that the very thing you want me to love, you also want me to be afraid of because I'm not quite sure where it's headed and what it's going to become. But here's the truth for us, as those who are rooted in the gospel, who, whose lives have been consequentially changed by the work of Jesus, is that we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to. We don't have to be afraid of tomorrow. We don't have to be afraid of the future, because we live today with the confidence and the assurance of what's to come tomorrow. We know, because of the work of Jesus in our lives today, that in the end, He wins tomorrow no matter who's elected president, no matter what disease everybody gets, no matter how bad the economy is, all of these things, we know that in the end, Jesus wins. This is this holistic, comprehensive nature of the gospel, that my past has been redeemed, my present reality has been shifted, and the future trajectory of my life has been altered for all of eternity, and I don't have to be afraid. I used to have to be afraid, but I don't have to be afraid anymore. Because I now live within the security and the provision and the comfort of a father who loves me like an Abba. That's the gospel in us. That's the work of Jesus on our behalf. That my past has been redeemed, my present has been shifted, and the future trajectory of my life has been altered literally for all of eternity. This is what you and I are being called to deeply, deeply celebrate and be saturated in. That this is where our work in any capacity in the world begins. That our work in the office, our work in our marriage, our work in our, in our school, our work on behalf of orphaned and vulnerable and, and abused and neglected kids ultimately begins and is rooted in His work on our behalf. And so before we ever even talk about the idea of caring for the marginalized or the abused or the oppressed, we have to first talk about the reality of the work of Jesus on our behalf, that we would be rooted deeply, deeply in the gospel, that we would be people who celebrate the gospel deeply and allow that to be what ultimately compels us into any work that God might have for us. And then that's what sustains us in the midst of that work even when it's hard. Because ultimately work is going to be hard. And I'm going to be met with, and you're going to be met with this confrontation where you begin to ask yourself, this is hard and it's difficult, and is it really worth it anymore? And what the gospel does is reminds us that our work is worth it. That our work uh, on their behalf is worth it because of Jesus' work on our behalf. So it sustains us in the midst of that that what we are called to celebrate deeply in this room doesn't terminate on us. It doesn't end there. Nowhere in Scripture does Jesus say, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to love me and celebrate me and have it just be me and you for the rest of your life and you are excused from any responsibility to share that with anybody else or to live that out in any capacity in your life whatsoever. I've looked really hard in Scripture for um, uh, loopholes, right? Like, God, is there any way that it can just be me and you and not anybody else, and I have no burden of responsibility for anybody else? I've looked really hard in Scripture, and I've yet to find it, because it doesn't exist. This idea that what we are called to celebrate doesn't terminate, it doesn't end on us, but it's meant to extend out into our demonstration, into the lives of others, and into the world around us. That ultimately, what we celebrate is what we demonstrate. That's the truth in Scripture. You want to know what somebody celebrates in their heart? Look at how, what they demonstrate in their lives. You want to know what, what, uh, what somebody's going to do with their life? Look at what they celebrate in their heart. 
that these two things are not mutually exclusive. That you can, you can look at one and you can see the other. An example of that in Scripture is when Jesus talks about our money. He basically says, you want to know what the heart loves? Look at how they spend their money. And you'll see that these two things are tied together. What they celebrate in their heart will be demonstrated through their money, and vice versa. So these two ideas are not mutually exclusive. So, if we are a people who are called to deeply celebrate the gospel, then we are also, by consequence, a people who are called to widely demonstrate that gospel. But here's the beautiful thing about being a part of the body of Christ, is that not all of us are called to demonstrate the gospel in the same way. That might, sound, that might be a strange statement to you. The world looks at the, at the church many, in many ways, and one of their accusations of us is that they all want us, they, that, that um, the world looks at us and says the church wants you to be uniformed and everybody looks the same and talks the same and listens to the same radio and carries the same Christian lunchbox and has the same Christian bumper stickers and goes to the same Christian school. We're all this, these uniformed machines, right? But that's not how the body of Christ works. The body of Christ is this collection and collaboration of uniqueness and diversity that we're ears and we're eyes and we're hands and we're feet all coming together around the common pur purpose of the work of Jesus and then being compelled to demonstrate the work of Jesus in very unique and diverse ways. Some are ears and some are eyes and some are hands and some are feet. We are not all called to do the same thing. Romans chapter 12 puts it this way. As in one body we have many members, and the members don't all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually we are members of one another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. Here's what he's saying, is that we're all different. That we all come around the, the common bond of Jesus, but we all have different gifts, and we're all called and compelled to express those gifts and those passions and that uniqueness in different ways. As we apply that grid to the space of foster care and adoption, we begin to see that it's not just about bringing kids into your home. If it's just about bringing kids into your home, although that is a significant place for the church to be, if it's just about bringing kids into your home, then right now my message to you college students would be, there's no place for you. Or to many empty nesters or almost empty nesters, I'd say, been there, done that, your kids are grown and gone, really not a place for you. But that's not the truth. All of us represented in this room, there's a place for us in this. And the reality is that we're not all called to do the same thing, but we are certainly all capable of doing something. That's how the body of Christ works. That there might be a family in this room that's bringing a child into their home, but then there are other college students and singles and empty nesters and young married and all these other people around them that are serving and supporting them in some capacity. It could look like this. I know it's kind of hard to see, but this might be a family that's bringing children into their home, and then they've got a team of people around them that are praying for them, bringing them groceries when that kid is brought into their home, donating supplies in the foster uh, care pantry uh, closet that we've got here at the church, even doing lawn care, bringing meals. Pa babysitting college students is a huge deal, and you'll hear more about that later. All these different ways that that the ears and the eyes and the hands and the feet can cooperate together for the same purpose. And you better believe the family that's bringing children into their home, they don't look at the people that are bringing the meals and say, you are so inferior to us. What we are doing is so much more important than you, but thank you for the lasagna. No. <laughs> you better believe that family that's bringing those, the kids into their home, look at all these different pieces on equal level. Like what you were doing for us is so important, not any more or less important than what we're doing by bringing these kids into our home. It takes all of us. And so you're going to be given some opportunities to hear about some examples of that. And so while we're not all called to do the same thing, we're all capable of doing something. And it could be said this way, perhaps you're either called to bring a child into your home or you're responsible for serving and supporting those who do. And so it may be that some of you go out, you graduate, you go off, you get a great job, and, and God just blesses you with the ability to make tons of money, but no time in your life to bring kids into your home. Well, you know what? You know what you need to do with that tons of money that God's given you when you're older? Is you need to pay for other people to be able to bring kids into their home. Because that's how the body of Christ works. Or maybe you might be in a season of life where we can't be, bring kids into our home, but we definitely want to, we want to babysit for those foster kids, those foster families who are because that's a way that we can serve them. Or a myriad of different ways. We're not all called to do the same thing, but we're all definitely called to do, and capable of doing 
something because that's how the body of Christ works. As Jesus interjected himself into our brokenness, so you and I, on some level, in some capacity, have the responsibility and the privilege to see the plight of those around us and to interject ourselves into it and to begin to bring a new reality out of an old and broken one. All of us on some level have the responsibility and the privilege and the calling to do that. Among the unending evidences that we live in a sin-scarred world, and it's no news to us, the world that we live in is sin-scarred, it's fatally flawed, and it's broken. You can watch the news later and it will remind you of all the different ways that it's broken. All these different unique ways, the economy, war, politics, disease, all of these different things are reminders to us that the world is groaning for something better and that something better is coming in Jesus when he'll make all things right. There's all of these evidences that we live, live within in the world that remind us it's not how it's supposed to be. Some of them are very overt and some of them are subtle. Some of you might not even be aware that right now you are actively participating in a demonstration of the fact that the world is not how it should be. Let me say that again. Right now, you and I, even in this room, are actively demonstrating uh, and participating uh, in, in a demonstration of the fact that the world is not how it's supposed to be. Let me, let me explain that. There are things in our world which have become normal. They're normative parts of our culture and society. And there are things which are normal now that God never intended to be normal. Okay? There's normal parts of the rhythm of our lives now that were never intended to be normal. Some of them have been, just become socially acceptable. Some of them have even become uh, legal, if that makes sense. That's not how it was intended to be, but that is the reality in which we live now. As you look back in the Garden of Eden, a couple of examples, one of which we're all participating in right now. All of us in this room are fully clothed. None of us are naked. You would have been stopped at the door, I'm sure. <laughs> That's probably ha tried, you know, the church has been here 50 years. Somebody's probably tried to walk in <laughs> naked and they've been stopped. But here's the truth. All of us in this room are fully clothed and that's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are naked and, what's the word? Unashamed. There's no shame. Why would there be shame? The, we don't know any other different way. This is the way that God intended it to be. Sin enters the picture and their immediate instinctual reaction is to run and hide and, then, and to feel the need to cover themselves. And from that moment on, throughout all the course of human history, you and I, people just like you and I, and you and I, have gotten up, gone to our dressers, gone to our closet, and what we have done is we have chosen what today's shame coverings are going to be. It's this physical, daily, experiential reminder to us that this is not how it's supposed to be. Right? Another example is um, the fact that there are thorns on roses and vines and thistles. We've got a lot of big thorn vines in some of the brush around our house. And as I, every time I see that, I'm reminded that's not how it's supposed to be. When you look back in the Garden of Eden, you see Adam is, is given charge of taking care of the land. And then sin enters the picture and the curse comes down. And specifically on man, the curse is this. Uh, you're going to work the soil and the soil is going to work against you. In essence, God is saying work is going to be very hard for you. That which you try to cultivate is actually going to work against you. It's going to be hard. And then on top of that, there's a very subtle statement where God says, uh, and there will be thorns and thistles on vines and branches. So it's as if God has said, here's the curse of sin for you, man. Work is going to be very hard, and to make it that much more difficult, as you're working the land, you're going to come across vines and, and plants that have thorns, and they're going to poke you and cut you and scrape you and prod you, just, as these little, just to be these little reminders to you, these little painful reminders to you, that this is not the way it's supposed to be. So the fact that you and I uh, take a rose, which has become the symbol of beauty and love and romance in our society, but in order to hold a rose, you have to be careful with it because it might hurt you. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's just, it's a daily, physical, experiential reminder that the world is not how it's supposed to be. When things which were abnormal in God's creation have become normal to us. There is an aspect of normalcy that is running throughout the current of our society on a daily basis. And it even happened last night and it will happen again at some point today. 
And it's the truth that there are kids, even right here in our own city, that are being abused, abandoned, neglected, and marginalized on a daily basis. And that is normal. It's normal. Last night, I can guarantee you, a Child Protective Services caseworker had to go to somebody's house in our community and remove a kid because it was dangerous for them. And the question is, where did that kid go? Who took that kid in? What does the trajectory of that kid's life look like from this point forward? This is a normal aspect of our culture that was never how God intended it to be. And for those of us uh, who have this, these consequential effects of the gospel in our life and are therefore compelled then to see the plight of others and interject ourselves into it, we have to claim that as unacceptable. That what is normal doesn't have to be normal because it's unacceptable and we are therefore compelled to do something about it. As we look through scripture, we see this reality is unacceptable for the heart of God too. We see this theme running through scripture that God secures and protects the rights of the helpless and the hopeless. That's what God does. That's why all of us are in this room today because we were helpless and hopeless, but God went to dramatic links, links in order to secure our rights through the work of Jesus. Deuteronomy 10 says that God executes justice for the fatherless. Psalm 68 says that He assumes the role of father to the fatherless. That means this, that when God sees uh, the fatherless, uh, He is so compelled towards them that He assumes the role of father in their life. Uh, and He's the protector of widows. God secures and protects the rights of the helpless and the hopeless. You can't get away from that theme in Scripture. The cross for us is really the crescendo of that truth. You ever want to know whether, you want to know whether or not God secures and protects the rights of the helpless and the hopeless? Look at the cross. That's the ultimate demonstration of that. That He would go to those great links in order uh, to secure us. That's just what God does. But it doesn't end there. That's not only what God does, but it's also what He demands of us. That we simply don't just celebrate that, but He also calls us to demonstrate that. So then He turns the tables. He says, now you give justice to the weak and the fatherless. You maintain the right of the afflicted. He says, you cease to do evil. You learn to do good. You seek justice. You correct oppression. You bring justice to the fatherless. Don't just celebrate this as a component of what I do for you, but also demonstrate this uh, in the lives of those around you. And so now our identity is wrapped up in this idea that you and I are correctors of oppression and seekers of justice. That's who we are. So you may be a college student that's working towards a degree, that's working towards a job, that's working towards a career and a lifestyle, but over and above all of that, your identity is not found in the fact that you're a college student or that this is your major or this is the job you get. Your identity is wrapped up in the fact that I am a corrector of oppression and a seeker of justice. Now, in light of that identity, what degree do I need to get? And what job do I need to get? And what city do I need to live in so that I can be the best seeker of justice and corrector of oppression that I can possibly be? Because that is my base identity. That's who I am in light of who Christ is for me. So what compels us then is this idea that we care for the abused and the neglected because we've been cared for greatly by Jesus that we seek justice for them because justice has been won for us, that we rescue them from their plights, not because we are the rescuers, but because we are the rescued, because in Jesus we have been rescued from ours. And then we adopt because Paul said in Galatians 4, we through Jesus are the adopted ones of God. That ultimately his work on our behalf compels us to do uh, work on their behalf that it's rooted in that, it's sustained in that, it's compelled by that, and that leads us to the most famous verse on orphan care in all of Scripture, James 1.27. And now we begin to see this isn't some isolated Scripture that just kind of stands all by itself. No, this is a continuation of everything that Scripture has been saying from the very beginning to the very end. That religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. It suggests to us that there is, a, there is an aspect of our faith. The word religion there isn't, don't think religion like, um, you know, strict uh, uh, system of church and law and all that. The word religion there is best translated as the word worship or demonstration of faith. It's this active word. So what James is saying is this. One of the clearest and purest and most undefiled 
uh, demonstrations and actions of your faith is to come alongside the oppressed and the helpless and the hopeless. Why? Why would Scripture suggest that, that um, this is one of the purest, most undefiled expressions and demonstrations of your faith? Because there's a ton of them. All these expressions of our faith. We can give, we can pray, we can serve, we can go to church, we can go to Bible. So all these different things that we do that demonstrate and express our faith. But Scripture seems to say there's one that ranks among the highest and the purest above all of those. Why? Well, caring for orphans puts the gospel on display with great vividness and clarity. Perhaps that's why the Bible calls it pure and undefiled. What do we mean by that? Caring for the marginalized and the oppressed and the abused and the orphan puts the gospel on display with this beautiful vividness and clarity and undefiledness, this pureness. Because what we are being given the privilege and the opportunity to do is the exact same thing that Jesus has done for us. That as we look at their plights, we look at their brokenness, we look at their, their uh, darkness, we are compelled then to interject ourselves into it, to take their brokenness upon ourselves, to redeem them out from their past broken context and to alter their present reality. To say your, your past was once defined by insecurity and instability, but your present reality now is defined by love and stability and protection and security that I interject myself into your brokenness, I, I redeem your past, and I alter your present reality. Everything now has changed. The old is gone and the new has come. And as a result of interjecting ourselves into their story and altering their present reality, we have the capacity and the beautiful privilege to alter their future trajectory. That because you are now mine, because you are now in our home, because we have interjected ourselves into your story, everything that will follow is changed now. That once you lived in a place of insecurity and instability and you were afraid of the future, now you don't have to be afraid anymore. Your present reality is marked by security and love and stability and the future trajectory of your life has been literally altered forever because of it. Does that make sense? So what we are being given the privilege and the responsibility to do is nothing less than exactly what Jesus has done for us. And in so doing, by doing that, we put the gospel on display in these beautiful and vivid ways, which is why I believe Scripture calls it pure and undefiled. That the world can look at that and see in the purest form what the gospel looks like. Make sense? Several months ago, I t I've told this story before to, to several people. Uh, my, our youngest daughter is adopted through foster care, and she looks different than our other three daughters. We have three biological, and then one youngest, our youngest is adopted. And uh, she and I were in the mall food court several months ago. Uh, and um, she's three years old now, and her afro is, is coming in you know, large and in charge, and we're trying to figure out how to manage all that. And I'm this white guy with a shaved head. And here we are together in the mall food court, and we're eating Lane's chicken strips. I don't even, I don't know where mom and sisters were, but here we are. And this lady, as, when we're out in public, we get looks and stares and questions because she looks different. And that's okay. We're prepared for that. And so I could feel it happening again with this lady sitting in the booth near us. And you could, you could feel her eyes just, just wondering what's going on here. What's with this three-year-old afro and this white white guy with a shaved head, right? You could just feel the curiosity from her, so I turn and, and, and break the ice and say, yeah, she's real cute, don't you see the resemblance, ha, ha, ha. And she laughs and she scoots closer to us. And what that tells me is uh, this conversation's not over, right? <laughs> and I've got a choice to make. I can be really annoyed by this because leave me alone, lady, just trying to eat my chicken strips, or I can see this as an opportunity. And what it turned into was an opportunity to share with her what she was seeing and, and uh, to explain to her why we, why we had the privilege to do what we get to do for a little girl like this. She was very grateful and appreciative and she walked away probably having heard about the person of Jesus and the gospel and foster care and all the stuff, the plight of these kids in a way that she maybe otherwise would not have heard. And that's an example to me of how in a very physical, real, experiential way we have the opportunity and the privilege uh, to put something on display, not to put ourselves on display, 
not to say, look how cool and awesome and, and holy I am for doing what I'm doing, but it just by nature, even in the mundane and the normal of eating chicken strips in the mall, has the capacity in a very pure and vivid way to communicate something to someone. I think that's what scripture is suggesting. That we are being given the privilege to do, exactly for, to do for them exactly what Jesus has done for us. And when we step into that, it will begin to put something on display around us that, that many people need to hear. So I want to close real quick and then introduce uh, some practical next steps. Um, just a few ways that we see this put on display, that we see the gospel put on display through this. Number one, it starts with this. It's just as much about um, pulling a child out of a broken story as it is about being pulled into one. Let me, let me um, explain that. It's often, foster care and adoption is often thought of in terms of I'm going to rescue a child. I'm going to pull a kid out of, my, out of their broken story and bring them into my comfortable uh, one, right? As you begin to engage in it, you find that this requires much more of you than that. Typically what we as, as American you know, suburban Christians like to do is we like to be involved in the mission of God as long as it doesn't compromise our own comfort and lifestyle. So God, I want, I want to do whatever it is you want me to do as long as, God, like you don't mess with the things that I want to keep in place here, right? So give me a place like a week-long mission trip or a service project that I can dip my hand into brokenness and then a week later I can step out of it and get back into my comfort, right? That's, let's just be honest, that's what we like. When it comes to foster care and adoption, that is not what's being asked of us and that um, in no way is what can ultimately play out. It's not just about reaching out, plucking a child out of a broken story and bringing them into a better one and then moving on. What ultimately ends up happening is that as we reach out to grab a kid, that kid actually pulls us into their broken story. And if we're not being willing to step into, if we're not willing to step into their broken story, then we will ultimately do these kids a disservice. What we see in the gospel is the story, here's Christmas again, Matthew chapter 1, is this idea that God didn't, God, didn't, God, God didn't reach out, pluck us out of our brokenness, and bring us into His glory. God actually saw our brokenness and stepped into it Himself and became a part of it. That the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, they shall call His name Emmanuel, which means God is with us. God's not over there, God's not somewhere, God's not near. God is here with us. He has entered into our broken story. That's what these kids need from us. Not that we would pluck them out of their broken story and be the heroes and the rescuers in their life. That we don't, we don't swoop into their lives with a cape, a cape on our shoulders. We crawl into their lives with the cross on our back. That's what these kids need. And then we ultimately point to Jesus as the hero in all of this. When I was nine years old, about nine years old, I learned that the man I had grown up calling dad was in fact not my biological father. As a nine-year-old kid, that came as a, a shock, as you can imagine, to a certain degree, because I had always grown up um, being asked by friends, uh, why don't you look anything like your dad? So, I don't know, it's just weird, I don't look anything like my dad. <laughs> well, now I know why, right? <laughs> Surprise, uh, because he's actually not your biological father. I learned, um, to a certain degree, the backstory of the first couple years of my life, and it was marked from my mom by um, a very, an abusive, dark relationship uh, that ultimately left her in a position of being alone with two young kids, myself and my older sister. At some point, uh, my mom meets the man who would become my dad. He's been a, he's a, been a worship pastor at Bible Church in Dallas, uh, different churches my whole life. Uh, they strike up a relationship, they fall in love, at the age of 23, guys, anybody close to 23? He gets down on his knee and he asks for the hand in marriage of a 31-year-old woman with two kids. Just wrap your mind around that, 20-something-year-old guys, right? Uh, for, for me, I'm thinking, wow, no, I don't know. No, I don't know if I could do that, right? But here's my dad that, that does this. And in so doing, taking the hand of my mom in marriage, he also takes the hand of my sister to become his daughter and me to become his son. He adopts me as his own and changes my first, middle, and last name. So in this family meeting of being told all of this, I'm also told you were born with a completely different name, first, middle, and last. And then we changed your name about two years old. 
And at the time, I didn't appreciate it, but as I've gotten older, I've grown to appreciate um, in very deep ways just exactly what my dad has done for me. That my dad looked at a situation and a woman he fell in love with and kids that he loved as his own and said, I know your story, I see your story, and I'm stepping into that story, and we're going to begin to write a new story. That the old is gone and the new has come, literally, you have a completely new identity. First, middle, and last name. Everything changes. And everything is going to change from here on out. The past is gone, new present reality, future trajectory changed forever. This really hit me on our wedding day. Emily and I were married at First Baptist Bryan uh, in June, 20, June 29, 2002. Y'all were like, I don't know, three years old at the time? I have no idea. We're getting really old, right? And my pastor dad was officiating the ceremony. So here we are, the three of us, standing up on stage, and this was about two weeks after I had turned 23. So as we're standing up there on stage, at some point in the wedding, it hits me, I'm 23, the same age, he was when he married my mom and took my hand as his son. The same age he was when he stepped in, into my story and literally changed everything about him. That this is a man who said, I see your broken story, I get it, I understand it, I accept it, and we're going to begin to write a new one. A few years ago, Emily and I had the privilege of becoming licensed foster parents, and in a couple weeks, we'll sign our new license here for Brazos County. And a few weeks after signing our license, we had the privilege of a little baby girl being brought to our home and placed in our arms and essentially being given the opportunity to do for her exactly what my dad had done for me and exactly what Christ has done for all of us. I see your broken story. I understand your broken story. We're going to become a part of that broken story and begin to write a new one. She's never left our home since. She has since become our daughter, and we've had the privilege of adopting her as our own changing her present reality and literally changing her identity, first, middle, and last name, and ultimately changing the future trajectory of her life as well. There hasn't been a day that's gone by uh, since she's been in our home that we haven't, on some level, stopped and considered, gosh, where would she be right now had we not been given the privilege of being a part of her story? And had we not been given the privilege of her being a part of our story, what would she be eating? Where would she be sleeping? What, what would she be playing with? Who would she be interacting with? All these questions of what her life may have looked like had we not been given the opportunity to step into it. It was my wedding day when it hit me. Gosh, what would my life look like had my dad not stepped into my story? And I think on, for all of us, we're all compelled to step back and to consider on some level, what would my life look like had Jesus not stepped into my story at just the right time and changed everything about it? That at just the right time, Jesus stepped into my story, said, I see your brokenness. I take your brokenness upon myself. Everything changes now, and everything's going to change moving forward because of it. Our answer to that question, where would I be right now had Jesus not becomes the framework and the foundation upon which you and I are compelled to do the same in the lives of these kids. So the question then becomes, I'm going to fast forward here so we can get to some Q&A. Our questions begin to change. They begin to change, they begin to move away from us and they begin to move to something better. That foster care and adoption is not first about what we can get but it's ultimately about what we are being called to give. That just as Jesus gave of his life, I'll go back one, where it says, You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become rich. It's this great exchange of the gospel. We were empty and impoverished in our sin. He was rich and full of his glory. He emptied himself of his glory, uh, took on our poverty, so that we could be filled with the riches of who he is. This great exchange of the gospel, that you and I are being called to give before we're being called to get. That it's better for us to give than to get. It doesn't mean that at the end of this we, might, we won't get something. We get a lot out of it. But our posture and our demeanor and our motivation first is we want to be a giving people because the gospel is a giving gospel. And so what does that mean for us? It means that our questions begin to shift. The question is not, am I supposed to? But the question is rather, how am I supposed to? So the question of am I called to this um, is one question. 
the question of how am I called to this is an entirely different question. I would argue from Scripture that as people who are called to celebrate, we're also people called to demonstrate. And that the mandate to care for the orphaned and the vulnerable is not a suggestion that God offers up to us. It's a mandate that He demands of us. So the question for us is not, I don't know if I'm called to this. I don't know. The question is, okay, how am I called? What's my, what's my place here? What's my role here? What's my unique place in this space? Second, it's less about getting a child for our family, and it's more about giving our family for a child. Again, we might end up getting a child for our family on the back end, but our motivation and our posture as a gospel people is, I first want to give. I want to give as Christ has given for me. And so it's not just about getting a child for my family. It's first about giving my family for a child who needs one, that we want to be a giving people. And then finally, this is a little harsh, but... You can handle it. Our no will be far more difficult on a child than our yes will ever be on us. There are legitimate fears and concerns and things that we need to be very aware of as we process through um, entering into this. But at the end of the day, uh, our, our yes for them uh, will be, will be uh, our, our no will be much more difficult on them than our yes will ever be on us. That's a hard truth, that's a hard reality, but it's the truth and it's reality. That we are looking out at the brokenness of what has become normal in our world, that kids are being marginalized and abused and orphaned on a daily basis. And if not us, church, to step into their brokenness and to change everything about it, then who else will? And yeah, our yes will be hard, but our no will be much harder for them.